every time that it's a podcast. Well, welcome everybody. This is not the This Is Not Therapy Hour. That's Brandon. I'm Mike, and I'll be introducing our special guest, Alyssa, in a little bit. But, um, well, welcome. My name is Mike Wang, and I have the pleasure of serving as the head of school over at Fusion Academy in Oak Brook, Illinois. Uh, it's a private school serving 6th through 12th graders, and we specialize, our, our niche is really serving kids in a one-to-one -one, uh, model of instruction. And we work with all sorts of kids, gifted, neurodiverse, and those who just need a little extra support academically, emotionally, or uh, executive functioning. Uh, welcome to the episode of Season 2 of Effective Artistry, Executive Functioning, and the Neurodivergent Mind, featuring Brandon Tessers, LCPC. And today we're going to talk about a really interesting topic on, on music therapy. So before we get started, as always, a reminder, today's stream will be recorded and then we will rebroadcast it in podcast form. Uh, we're currently streaming on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube, so keep that chat box full. To, we want you to be engaged. We want this to be a resource that you can use. Um, I'll help moderate and read the questions as they come in. Today, we have a very special guest on the screen, Melissa Stone. Uh, those of you guys that are, watch, are watching, she's, she's right there. And she's a board certified music therapist and the founder and owner of Dynamic Links, and that's L Y N K S, um, where they focus on holistic therapy through movement and music. Um, they offer individual and group therapy sessions, adaptive yoga, music lessons, and, and they serve a broad range of clients, including folks with autism. Um, and that's all for the introductions. It's my pleasure to give the floor to our featured guest and host, Brandon Tessers and Alyssa Stone. Hello. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Alyssa, for joining us. Um, Super psyched to be here, talking yeah. about my favorite thing, music, <laughs> executive functions, everything in between. Right. That's yeah. like, I always tell people I'm a very deeply weird person, which is what enables me to do my work because most people are not like, yes, we get to talk about music and executive functioning, but like I'm legitimately very excited about this. I couldn't be more excited. It's all I talk about all the time. So I'm very pumped to jump on and share that with other people too. You know, we, uh, I'm just going to mention that like we always do these pre kind of, I don't know, it's not an interview. It's just to get to know you kind of thing. And, and when we did that, the three of us, Alyssa and I ended up talking for quite some time because I also could talk about this for a long time and want to learn about what you had to say. And, and you know, something that's uh, not always a strength of mind that Mike helps me with uh is making things very practical and that's one of the things i'm really excited about that the stuff you're talking about like the title we have today make playlists with purpose is that what we said playlist with purpose yes that there's like very practical of course we have talked about the big stuff and the theory and the research but that it comes down to like hey here's some things to do uh so yeah we uh we are going to have a fun conversation it'll be more about whether we can keep on track <laughs> absolutely think. we'll try and stay in the zone um <laughs> Go ahead, well, Mike. I you Alyssa, yeah, I mean, Alyssa, I just read exactly what's off on, on your website. Why don't you tell sure. us a little bit more about yourself and how you got into the work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the first thing I always try to tell people about is what is music therapy? Because um, I think when I tell people I'm a music therapist, they go, oh, I listen to music. Music's my therapy, too. And I want to validate that and say, yes, that like music can be a very effective therapeutic outlet for us, a creative space, having these leisure opportunities is so important for everyone. I also think creativity and self-expression through the medium of art, music, dance, acting, drama, all these things are very important. And that's where music therapy gets in. So we use that magic of why music is effective for a therapeutic purpose and study how and why it works. So we're taking that inherent nature of music as a therapeutic medium and understanding how it's impacting our brain and body and how we can use that to facilitate a transfer of functional skills, developmental skills, mental health skills, you name it, we do it through music. So while it's inherently therapeutic, a board certified music therapist studies how to use that music to reach the goals that you want to work on or the areas of opportunity that might present themselves. So as opposed to a phrase like retail therapy, which basically just means doing fun things is fun. It's, yes. it's as opposed to a phrase like talk therapy, meaning <clears throat> you're engaging in a therapeutic process through the medium of music 
although I'm sure you do a lot of talking as well, as opposed to the primary medium being speech. Absolutely. And it just depends on the person. There's a lot of sessions I have. I mean, I work with non-speaking individuals, so I can use just music the whole time to work on those skill areas. But exactly, we are still the vessel of therapy. The mode we use is music versus talk therapy. The mode would be talking or dance therapy. The mode is dancing. You name it. Everyone has their way of doing it. But Mm -hmm it's in the expertise and the experience of the trained professional who then goes, how can I use this music? What am I seeing? What's reflecting with my client? How can I support them using that mode? You know, it's it's interesting um, because I don't know what's just my perception and awareness of things versus what's a common one, but I always kind of assume if it's mine, it's probably common. (laughs) They're like art therapy is a more well-known example of this where everyone's like, yes, that's therapy that utilizes art. Music therapy isn't something that I had heard nearly as much about before you and I started talking. I, I imagine that's the case, but you're the expert. Is, is this something that's like more widespread or kind of more state of the art? I want to say it's really widespread, but still unknown. Like your perception, I do believe is reality. People are like, oh, music therapy. I've never heard of that. It must be new. Been around since the 40s. I mean, we've been around since the 1800s. The study of music as medicine has been around in the medical profession for a long time. And a lot of the research started there. And then it became its own profession in the 1940s, 1950s, gained traction. We became a entity that was overseen by a national board. Then we got our national certification and all of those things. I feel like art therapy, I don't know why that's the most common one. I don't have the answer for why. Yeah. That is um, because we have art, dance, movement, drama, and music therapy are all under the creative arts therapy umbrella. And you hear expressive arts and those things. It would all be the same umbrella. Um, we exist. There's 9,000 of us in the U.S. as of 2020. So there's more now, I'm sure, which is very exciting. And in the greater Chicago area where we're all based, there's a t- ton of us. The Great Lakes region of the music therapy is one of the largest um, And I would say, not to poo-poo any other music therapy regions, because we're all amazing, but a really strong region of music therapy with great research facilities and institutions and a lot of educational opportunities here. Um, So we exist and we've been existing, uh, but I'm not sure where the disconnect is with why people don't know it's out there. So... I guess, well, you know, hey, we're working on it right now. Right? Like Absolutely. We're familiar. trying advocacy opportunities. Yes. Um, I'm curious because w- when I think of it as an you know, opportunity cost thing, right? Like you are a music therapist as opposed to being a different type of therapist. So my question is why? What is it about music therapy that pulls you more? But in two kind of ways. One, yes, you personally, what is it that you find interesting about music therapy? But also in terms of like evaluating the the utility of the methodology, what is it about music therapy that is makes it more suited for certain kinds of things or, you know, or maybe everything? I don't know. Maybe it's globally. Yeah. Just <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll start with the first part, the me. Uh, I mean, music has been my life and my passion since I was a young child. So that was always something I wanted to engage in. So when I found that there was this profession where I could support people and use what I love and what brings me so much joy and support itself, I thought, why not? And I think that's what keeps turning me back to it. I'm in my graduate program for music therapy, something that I do think is important to know. We're not a master's level entry field. You only have to have a bachelor's degree to practice as a board certified music therapist. And that's because from day one of undergrad, we are studying and implementing music therapy. So it is four very intense years of music coursework, psychology coursework, anatomy, physiology, neuroscience, all of that bundled into one package. So they do it in four years of undergrad instead of you getting an undergrad and going for your two-year master's. So I'm pursuing my master's on top of that because I want to seek more. And I had that exact question that you kind of asked, of, do I want to go for an LCPC or an LCSW or something else to add to it? Because music therapy isn't really billable through insurance. It's pretty unknown. Do I want to get my master's in something adjacent and go that route. And I said, no, like I keep returning to music therapy is what I want to do. And there's so much unique benefit to it, which gets to your second question. Um, the way music impacts the brain is different than anything else 
in general. All things impact the brain, but music is a whole brain stimulus. So we're able to impact different brain areas. So we're able to support people in a way that's not traditional access. Talk therapy is accessing some of those traditional neural pathways in the brain and music can reroute and go around that. And I love that we can impact people in a different way that traditional talk therapy or another style of therapy might not be accessible to them, but also impact people where traditional talk therapy does work for them but they're looking for something that's more of a personal and intrinsic connection as well, which is where I think music plays a really vital role. I don't do adult mental health, but there's music therapists that absolutely do. And we have specific techniques and strategies and advanced certifications for that as well. So I keep coming back to it. I really was like, hmm, do I want to bill through insurance? And I went, you know what? All the systems are broken. I'm just creating my own (laughs) system over here. Who cares if I can bill or not? Let's make it work. Well, I mean, I think we have that in common here. So this is a good group of people. I, I honestly, I think the same way about getting a doctor at myself. It's like, if I get the doctor in front of my name, people will listen differently. But is it worth doing all that just for a marker of credibility, you know, yep. in yep. a broken system? Um, so I'm curious then, and there's all these things that distinguish it. What would you say to somebody who's exploring therapy and and exploring different modalities, music versus talk versus art, you know, are there things for which you find it better suited or where certain types of people or people who are dealing with certain kinds of things would be served to explore it more? I think, so we serve neurodivergent individuals. I think it's a great modality for that because differently wired brains might require different styles of therapy. I also think it's a great thing to explore if you've tried traditional talk therapy and it just didn't resonate with you on the level you were hoping it to. I have a a friend uh, and I'll keep their information, you know, very gray area, but they were, they know I'm a music therapist and they're like, is this for adults too? Cause I think a lot of people think it's just for kids. Like, Oh, we play with shakers and drums and it's just for little kids. And it's like, it can be, but it can be so much more. And she was like, do you think this would work for me? And I was like, well, tell me about your experience. And she had tried, all of, you know, CBT and all DBT, all of the things for all of her different areas of need. And I said, well, you know, there's, a, I found her a music therapist five minutes from her home. I was like, you're very lucky you're in New York. There's lots of them. Give it a try, reach out to them and see if they have like a, a discounted initial rate to see what works for you. And she went and she was like, this is the best therapy I've ever had because music immediately releases dopamine and all those good feeling neurotransmitters from that engagement and enjoyment experience. So it can create an immediate positive connection between client and therapist in a way that doesn't require words and doesn't require the level of rapport building. So you have this immediate way to connect with your client, to connect with the person in front of you, and then build from there. So I think it's something everyone can and should explore the creative arts therapies to see what feels best for them in therapy. Because while we're working in therapy, we should also be feeling good and getting those, those positive releases within the therapeutic relationship. Hmm. Can you understand a little bit more of what music therapy actually looks like for a client that's interested in engaging in a session? Sure. It, can be so different as all therapy can. Um, So I'll tell you kind of the basics of the elements of music therapy. So you have receptive experiences in music therapy. So that's listening experiences. So that might be kind of what we're talking about today. A therapist who's creating a playlist with purpose for you, or you're listening to something to process through emotions you're feeling, to downregulate, upregulate. It can be active music making where you're engaging in musical experiences. You do not need to have any musical ability to engage in music therapy. That's our job, not yours. We we have to make it aesthetically pleasing. You just have to show up and be willing to participate. Um, so a lot of times that's unpitched percussion, drumming, using different instruments to express specific things, create song compositions. That would be more interactive and constructive of I'm writing songs to process through what I'm feeling. I'm creating musical compositions that evoke the emotions I would like. I'm using this music to express those feelings that I can't always express through words. And then we also have improvisational. So making music in the moment where the therapist is 
some of those traditional terms of therapy, mirroring and supporting through the music what the client is showing them. And they're creating this interactive music experience together. And that's often the highest level because we're getting rid of words, getting in touch with ourself, our mind, body, and the therapist is engaging and scaffolding that up and facilitating those interactions. So those are the basic elements that you might see in session, but the structure of the session looks different for every individual because it's based on their needs. And we see all ages and stages. So we, while we specialize in children through, you know, age 18, 23, right up through transition programs, there's plenty of music therapists who never work with kids and they only work with adults or they work with older adults and aging populations. You know, it's, it's funny because of course, because it's less known, you know, we're asking these questions partly because we don't know it yeah. for you to have an opportunity to share with the audience. But like as a talk therapist, if somebody asked me what it looks like and I, you know, to to have to explain like, well, sometimes I listen and sometimes I speak and sometimes I ask questions, you know, like the elements of a thing when, of course, there's so much nuance to what right. do you say and when do you say it, you know, right. but without people being able to experience it themselves as commonly or have as much knowledge, it's like, oh, okay, you make music, sure. It's like, yep. yes, we, we talk, but we talk yep. in specific ways. <laughs> yes. Um, this might sound like a weird question. I'm saying that more for the audience because you and I okay. talk to people <laughs> to listen. Sure. I know, you know, we get along this way. I, I often, I think of like neurotransmitter type research as, as tautological, right? That like, if we say, why does a thing feel good? Well, because it releases dopamine. Well, why does it release dopamine? Because it feels good. You know, like it's just, but if we can go past that, because music does occupy this kind of weird space in like just the human psyche or, or myth or whatever yeah. of this like magical in-between space. Aside from the just, it releases transmitters. What is it about music either that, that there's research for or just your own theories about that why does it so commonly affect people in that way? Well, there's tons of research and all the things. So I'm a neurologic music therapist and I use neuroscience informed approaches. So what you're saying, 100%. Why does the neurotransmitter happen? Because it happens. And then that right. triggers the neurotransmitter, which is why it happens. Absolutely. <laughs> and we're studying more and more that why and that how. And I love to operate in both spaces. That if a wonderful experience is happening in front of you, we don't always have to figure out why. We can enjoy the wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Awesome. If there's not, cool, let's go do that maybe. But when clearly someone is benefiting from it, you're like, great, let's keep doing that. That is the thing for them. But the other path up that hill is the science behind the magic of, okay, it's doing this and why. And the best reason I can give you is because music's a whole brain experience. So a lot of people think our brain is lateralized of like right side creativity, left side language and logic, which we know is untrue. And the great thing about music is it's accessing everything. We do have lateralized specifications of music, which is why we can access specific things in specific ways. If someone maybe has a deficit on one side of the brain, we can try and connect with it through a different side of the brain in music. But music has on the left side, rhythm, tempo, form, sequence, analysis, reading and writing music. But on the right side, melody, timbre, loudness, intonation, intervals, emotion, creativity. And we have this whole brain experience when we're listening to making, improv music where rhythm is facilitating and activating one side more strongly. Rhythm is still a whole brain experience um, and it's a cerebral experience as well. It's kind of the basis of how music therapy works, but we're facilitating that activation across the entire brain. So we're able to support people and get those things firing in a different way. So when it's like, well, why is this happening? I could say, oh, because the rhythm's doing this, or oh, because the emotion is being prompted by this element of the music and we're activating this brain area, potentially. I would have to have somebody like in an MRI or, you know, really deep brain analysis right. to say for certain. Well, that's I, I do love that always about neurological research, which is when we're saying this part of the brain does X thing, what we mean is when we put someone in such a condition or ask them to do such thing, we see electrical activity exactly. there. Or someone has physical or physiological damage in a place and then their behavior or whatever is modified in yeah. such a way. Um, 
ask, of course, then there's the whole like experimenting on rats thing, which is hilarious to me in its own way. Uh, <laughs> but no, so I, I'm trying to think about this because I agree with you. You know, one of my like core tenets on therapy, just life in general, is you can't answer the question of why. There's, we can say there's correlations, or we can come to like definitely practical conclusions. Sure. You know. Uh, that aren't worth thinking more deeply, but you can't really say every possible thing that impacts this. So I always hit on when we're exploring why it's for the purpose of coming up with something new to try for the future. We're just, we come up with a story, oh, you feel X because of Y. If that's true, then if we change Y in this way, then maybe X feeling will also change. And if it doesn't work, of course, many like people in the helping professions generally will then be like, well, you're doing it wrong. You're resistant or, you know, <laughs> as opposed right. to like, nope, that story wasn't useful. Let's try a different one. Correct. So I, I like thinking, I mean, maybe this is only interesting to me, but <laughs> I like thinking about it in that way. Cause to me, what talk therapy is the way I can think of it as being unique as language, spoken language, you know, language isn't just verbalized audio visual, but communication between people it's, connection between the sign and the signified. So it occupies this strange space between it exists in the physical environment, but connects to things in the cognitive environment that aren't actually there. So it allows me who is outside of you, but in your physical environment to impact your internal environment in that way. And of course, music and everything in the environment does that as well. But it does seem like there's something about music specifically that is different from other forms of communication and other environmental things in that way. I, I'm wondering how much of that, and not that this has an answer, this is just where my brain is going. How much of that is like finding the right balance? We've talked in the past about you create a space that's safe, you know, where people know they're going to be okay, and then explore within that space that you can't try new things unless you know there are some boundaries. I'm wondering if music has some element of that, you know, that rhythm offers a predictability. I know what's coming next so I can stop paying attention to the rhythm of it and then focus more on this other piece that it's a way of like creating a, a safe space to play in. Absolutely. I mean, if we think about it from like a Maslow hierarchy of needs perspective and get really basic with, I know a lot of people saw that visual through the pandemic of safety and your physical being feeling like you're in that space that has clear boundaries and expectations, rhythm provides that inherent steady tempo for you where it regulates your brain and body on a subcortical level, then we're providing that space of safety where we can connect through the music in a different way. And not that it always works like that for every client that comes in the room, rapport building and therapeutic relationship is still critical to be able to really facilitate those next level skills. But music provides that inherent automatic regulation, autonomic, I should even say, because it is part of that system, regulation, off the bat where you have that as the basis and then we can grow from there. Mm -hmm. And I think what you said too of, oh, this doesn't work, then you're not doing it right. I think the cool thing of music too, not that you feel that way, but that right, others right. feel that way, right? I'm like, I know Brandon does not feel that way. <laughs> but if you're not doing, if it's not working, try something else. There's so much else to try with the music. If mm. this one element isn't working, we have 17 other elements we can try. And we have a scientific rationale for why they might work. And then we see who they work best with. Um, and so I think that's a great part of it too, is it's a vessel that's so adaptable and moldable to the person in front of you that you can keep trying different things, throw the spaghetti at the wall until it sticks and you have some safety and making sure you're doing it in an ethically and valid way for the individual in front of you. Yeah, I, I like that. And I, I really do, I think of... Um... Well, I was going to say therapy, but I think this is true of education as well. It's like when when people, including the practitioners themselves, when they conceptualize it as there is a right answer and I, the professional, can help you find the right answer that you won't be able to find without me, that that, that can be really harmful. It works a lot of the time, but can be harmful. But that more if it's approach that what it should be or what I do and what you're saying that you do and what you guys do at Fusion is, I have reasons for why I might start or think that this is the most likely thing to, to help with whatever. But if it doesn't, I also have ideas and reasons to go to the next thing and the next. And I never run out because even if I've exhausted everything I already knew, I also know how to come up with new things. So it's not you come to us to learn the right answer and the right thing to do. It's 
we help you to just know that there's always another thing to try. If that didn't work, let's try something else. And you never run out of options. Yeah. Yeah. I love that kind of perspective of that. And I think the cool thing that we know in therapy, and I think the cool thing about fusion as well, where it's that one-to-one -one environment is you come in with a basis and then so much of therapy is your client throwing that completely upside down and saying something mind blowing. And you're like, whoa, yeah, let's go there. And I yeah. think that's, that's something I have a hard time with our newer clinicians too, because it takes some of that you can't learn it in a textbook. You can learn all the rationale behind it, but being so present in the moment that you're actively hearing every little thing or even the musical cues from the client and then reflecting and transitioning that to the next step. I think that's something that's so important that we have and that we have that adaptability and creativity of, mm, and the next thing, ooh, ooh, okay, I heard that. Ooh, let's do this next thing. Ooh, let's try this. Yeah, let's go here. Yeah. And I think new clinicians and even new educators are so focused on what's the plan, what's the goal, what are we doing, and lose the beauty of that moment of, and I reflect that a lot when I'm doing supervision and observations of my new team members of, Ooh, I loved what you did, but there was this really beautiful moment right here where you were focused on the goal and you missed what they said. And that could have been 45 minutes of magic right there. And they're like, dang, I did miss that. Uh, and I mean, I'll watch video recordings. I do a lot of telehealth and I'll, I'll record things for clients to take home and I'll listen to them and I go, oh man, I missed that right there in the moment. And sometimes it's the Zoom because if you're saying two things at the same time, we can't sure. hear it. But I'm like, that was it. That was that was the moment and I missed it. And that's okay. We can go back. But so much of that where we're really able to hear and engage with the client on that level and keep changing and growing throughout the session. I So maybe you can help me with something because I, I you know, we talk about finite resources and especially attention a lot in, in this space, attention, awareness, whatever, that every piece of my attention or working memory that's going to developing my own analysis, my own narratives about what's happening is a piece that can't go to observing and being in, impacted by you. And we miss those things. So I've been trying to come up with this word and I, I don't know because I don't like listening or watching because those are ableist. They, you know, they're about specific sure. senses. I don't like observing because it's too passive. But something to describe the the process of I am dedicating as much of or a significant amount, you know, it's never going to be all of my attention to you in very specific and granular detail and bringing that in and allowing it to impact me as opposed to just going off of my idea. And I just saw someone say paying attention in the in the chat, which, yeah, but there's something about I, I don't know, I want like. I, I mentioned this right now specifically because someone I, at one point I was saying attend, but that has other connotations with like, sure. Services. And I thought recently just this week about a tune, which mm. since we're talking about music, I don't know. It just seemed, what, what do you do when you're with, cause I have the same thing. And Mike, I'd also love to hear from you. Cause I imagine training new teachers at, at fusion involves a lot of this too is, not necessarily unlearning the old way of this is the right thing and how it must be done, but then saying, okay, sure, there's reasons we do it that way. And if it has limits and when you hit those limits, here's what you do next. You know, how do you teach this concept effectively and, and concisely, you know? Yeah, I think it, I don't have the answer for concisely. <laughs> <Me neither. laughs> I, feel like, I feel like that's the hardest part is that that's a lot of our supervision and yeah. having that ongoing support of a tune. And the word that came to mind for me too was construct and reconstruct. Cause you're constantly constructing around what is happening in front of you and then reconstructing your plan based on what's happening around you. Um, and I think what I mostly remind them is to, to stop. I think I put this on my Instagram today, listen first then respond, then act, then move forward. And we know it, but really living it and doing it of how can you attune so precisely in that moment, then stop, then respond. And I see it a lot, especially having come from higher need autism centers where there were high magnitude 
behaviors and a lot of safety concerns that they're always moving, 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 doing, doing, doing. And I think that just perpetuates some of the sensory dysregulation that we're seeing because we're constantly moving forward instead of stopping, reflecting, and reconstructing through mm. that. Um, so I don't have the answer on concise, but just active presence in the moment. And the biggest tip I give my employees is to do a, a meditation before they begin their session to get their headspace down regulated. Because when we're up here and we're in our cerebral and we're in our all of not cerebral. Yeah, cerebral, that's what I mean. Right. Yes. <laughs> we're cerebral, we're not subcortical. And we have to be in that place of complete regulation and ability to take in to get where they are. Yeah, um, listen, I love what you're saying about the that taking that moment before they're in session to sort of be able to center themselves. I, I think but when it comes to teaching training new teachers here in a one-on-one -on -one setting, it's it's not necessarily throwing out the entire book of how education should have played out. I mean, we all have the tendencies to do how we were taught, um, to teach how we were taught, and it's sort of being able to recognize and reflect in that moment of, but why? Why am I doing it this way? Is this actually what that kid needs in front of me? Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate what you're saying here. We have some comments in the chat that I'd like to... Oh, bring them on, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of our commenters said, I also probably have some degree of, help me with the pronunciation. Alexithymia. Alexithymia, but making music lets me kind of sit in that emotional space without. I'm not sure how to express it, but like the pressure of, uh, of like the overhanging question of what, what be the emotions, how to emote. Um, yeah. So just real quick, I'll throw out for the audience what alexithymia means, in case anybody doesn't know. It refers to a, a condition, not necessarily a diagnostic condition, but uh, the state of being someone who has a difficult time observing and labeling, naming, or communicating your emotional state. So if you ask someone who experiences alexithymia, and yes, most people would say has alexithymia, but I'm specifically not saying it that way. Um, how are you feeling? They all say, I don't know. I don't know. Right. And there's a lot of like intriguing stuff in there, but, uh, but just to have like a baseline for, yeah. for what we're talking about. Well, I think the cool thing about that and what might be the reason that's so supportive for you too, is because linguistically labeling it, but actually feeling it can be two different things. And music allows us to experience that emotion and maybe express it in a way that we don't have to put a label on that and define it, but we can experience it and emote it in a way that's effective. So you can show it or experience it through others. My apologies, there's a dog barking outside. Uh, you can experience it through others in that music making. Uh, so that might be why it's supportive and a reason we use it so often in our practice, because especially with young children, period around emotions, they don't have control of that from a neurological perspective. They don't have the words for it. They don't have the experience for it, but they sure do feel it. And how mm -hmm. can they express it? And how can we facilitate that connection to the emotion, regulation and support of the emotion in a way when we don't have the words or we don't have the neural pathways yet to effectively manage, regulate all of those things? I like that. And and I agree. I mean, that's, I think of alexithymia as a linguistic issue yeah. more than an observational or experiential one, because not that everyone experiences emotions in a similar way or to a similar extent, because obviously we don't, but emotion has to be experienced in order to exist. Like it's, it's not possible to be depressed and have no experience of whatever right. that is, but not being able to categorize it or label it or communicate it, including within yourself, right. To be able to, like, we've talked a lot in the past that language guides attention and memory, you know, that if I don't have, a way to condense the data because the experience of feeling angry for example is like anything incredibly chaotic and nuanced i can't actually be aware of all the things i'm observing that add up to me saying i feel angry and it's different every time and it's different for every person but if i have angry as a word then i have some ability to connect that experience to a different experience that shares some pieces of it and now i can put together larger patterns and etc so 
if we think of music then, because I, I am exploring this idea as, you know, communication, I always define as anything I do with the specific intent of impacting what you, whatever person I'm trying to communicate with, thinks or feels or does. That doesn't mean it's always manipulative. You know, I might want to help sure. you and know more yeah. about, you know, but th that it's not gated by one specific method of communication. And that there's also the other element of like in alexithymia, I need to be able to communicate with myself internally. And so perhaps I'm someone or, you know, in the comment, perhaps you're someone who has developed more of an internal, I've heard people use different terms for this, but mental ease is one that Cecil's uh, helped me define, you know, semiotics, whatever, that my internal way of categorizing and labeling an emotional experience is through music, is through sound in some way that I can utilize. And sometimes you'll even meet people and you say like, okay, what are you feeling? And they'll be like, it's it's kind of like a light, like floaty aria, you know, <laughs> like yeah. trying to describe it in those terms. Yeah. And in Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy, they actually have like emotional categories for different musical styles and elements of music. So it could be a way to find the word based on the descriptor that you're experiencing within the music as well. Not that we need to find the word. Like you said, we don't need to gatekeep communication to just that linguistic component and the right. expressive language component. But there's inherent studies and ideology around what styles of music are communicating something specific as well. So someone could show you or play you through music what they're feeling. And you can help label it yourself as well. Oh, this might be this for me. Hmm. Well, it's a tool, <laughs> especially talking in terms of neurodivergence and autistic and non-speaking autistic people or intermittently speaking autistic people, um, that the entire kind of point of what we're saying when we're talking about that is somebody who internally experiences, as best we can tell, a relatively like full range, you know, normal, whatever expected range of things, but struggles with the ability to communicate it and that introducing a different modality of communication you know, allows them to communicate something in a different way, right? Exactly. But, and of course, you can learn people's languages too, right? And it's spoken, not spoken, but um, shared language, uh, you know, shared across communities and especially big, broad communities does have a, a more efficiency to it. It is like uniquely efficient because we can have never met before and I can still have a reasonable expectation that if I say this word, it'll mean something like this to you. Whereas with music or any other modality, like I do need to get to know you particularly, even though I can make a prediction that something like this is going to tend to make people feel more light and airy. There's not a lot of specificity to that necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the cool thing about having worked with a lot of my clients for like four and five years, they can walk in the room and I immediately am like, oh, okay, okay. I'm picking up what every part of you is putting down right now. And we can go from there because so much of that communication is through our body or through the music we're making or the tempo that we're using. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking about it and maybe the word I'm looking for really is just connect. That's what connect, we yeah. you know, like if I'm paying very close attention to you and modifying my thoughts and feelings and behaviors based on what I'm picking up from you in whatever way. Maybe we just mean connect. And and in that case, what we're meant to do as therapists, educators, is just be people who are really good at connecting with yeah. clients, yeah, not absolutely. needing to know in advance, but connecting with that individual. Yeah. That style, Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy, they have two clinicians at all times in the room and their sessions are recorded. So they're never tracking data or analyzing in the moment. Their goal is to be fully connected and present. And they have one therapist who's just leading musically and one therapist who's the floor therapist who's engaging with the client. So one person who's just fully attuned to how the music needs to be change to support or reflect what the client is showing us or to scaffold us up to the next goal. And then one therapist who's completely focused just on that client and facilitating that connection with them one-to-one. -one. And then they review and watch the video and collect the data and reflect. Um, that's not a sustainable model of therapy <laughs> that I think we could implement uh, to have essentially three to four hours of billable time for one session. Um, they're often kind of grant funded and nonprofit funded, and they're based a lot about out of the UK. And it's wonderful if we could have that here, that'd be great. Uh, I would be all about that. Um, but I think it kind of gets to all those points of attunement, connection, 
construction, and then the evaluation, the analysis and data, you don't have to stress about it because it's coming later. And you can always reflect back and say, oh, okay, here's here's those moments that I can continue to grow on and look for next time. I am going to butt in. Yes. I am, <laughs> I am old enough to remember creating playlists by having a cassette tape ready and pressing record and play when the radio yes. was playing my song. And I was creating playlists like that. Alyssa, let's promise and let, let's deliver on our promise. Absolutely. How, how do we use playlists to help us through, through sure. our for executive functioning for all the good things? For all the good things. Well, I would say they help us get our brain into the desire. They can assist us in getting our brain into the desired state where we want to be. So when we talk about building playlists with purpose, we're using this concept that is actually a music therapy concept. It's called the ISO principle where we are using the music to meet us where we are and then using it to upregulate or downregulate with those elements that we talked about, tempo, rhythm, melody, timbre, pitch, harmony, to get us where we want to go. So you want to start your playlist where you are to match your current state. So if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling exhausted, if you're struggling with depression, if you're feeling really hyper and active and your attention just is not there, you want to match that with the music. And now this is where the theory gets into it a little bit of, well, what matches that? So typically what usually works most of the time and what the evidence backs up is if we're feeling really in a heightened state, fast tempo, lots of high timbre instrumentation, which would be horn sections, right? Really vibrant tonality, loud tonality, quick paced, and lyrics that facilitate that as well, often with the emotional connection that we might be looking for. But a lot of the research shows us that the lyrics aren't as important as all the other scaffolded elements of music, that what you're hearing isn't as important as the instrumentation and the basis of the words that you're hearing, because your brain isn't necessarily interpreting them the same way. And then if I'm feeling really hyper or anxious, down regulating from there. So switching the, and decreasing the tempo or decreasing the number of instruments or decreasing the range and bringing it down slowly. I suggest to people five songs because typically that's 15 minutes and we don't all have 30 minutes to an hour to get ourselves ready to go. Um, if that's what you need though, build your short playlist, your medium playlist, your long playlist for regulation. If you have the time and you want to devote, you know, your morning, for example, we made a, in preparation for this podcast, I made a Sunday scaries playlist mm -hmm. on Spotify where it's like, oh, it's the Sunday before I need to pump up for work. Like I need to relax. You could use it as a Monday morning pump up to get over the Sunday scaries. Uh, and that one is a little longer. So it could be your commute. It could be your morning routine of making coffee, but using the music to scaffold up to the state that you would like to be in. So I, I want to build on that a little bit, but just real quick, yeah. to like translate some and give some like practical examples for people who might have a harder time following like the conceptual language, which, sure. you know, I have created an environment of for sure. <laughs> I <understand>. um, <laughs> but talking about like instrumentation versus what is being said. I mean, we have a lot of famous pop cultural examples of that. The, my favorite to think of is Outkast's Hey Ya, uh, which is yeah. so like, upbeat and dancing and everyone loves it. And then when you point out that all the lyrics are actually about how love is impermanent and, you know, loss is inevitable and those kinds of things. Um, or even, oh, go ahead. I would say even like I Will Always Love You, Whitney Houston, is like everyone has it as like the love ballad, a first dance song. And I'm like, this is a breakup song. This is a breakup song. Like if you listen to the lyrics, it's about how we should not be together and yeah. I'll always love you. But people use this as a first dance song because it triggers all those emotions and it has that melody, that tempo, that timbre, that tonality to it. But the words, mm -mm. Yeah, there's a... I'm not a country person, but I'm trying to bring it in because, you know, a lot of sure, people are. sure. There's a famous country song, and I don't remember who originally sang it, but I think, anyway, it's called The Day He Stopped Loving Her, Ooh. and and which sound is very, you know, but it's about a guy who loves his wife or his whatever until the day he dies. It's the day he stopped loving her is the day he died. He loved her until that moment. Um, so what you're saying then is lyrics, great. If you find something that has the right feel in, in whatever other ways, pitch and timbre and, you know, volume and rhythm and whatever and lyrics that also go along with it great that's even more effective but if you find stuff that works in the other way and the lyrics don't quite match that doesn't matter so much exactly yes 
And it can be tricky. Something you want to keep in mind is if it's a song that has a deep emotional experience or deep memory tied to it, then those lyrics could be part of it. Um, we also have this thing in music therapy called associative mood and memory training. So it's what you'll see a lot when they have, um, you might see like viral examples on Facebook of individuals with Alzheimer's listening to playlists. And what they're doing is a modified version of associative mood and memory training where they're triggering a memory associated with that musical experience because it's so deeply embedded in our brain that is bringing you back to that. And what music therapists then do is use that memory to facilitate a mood response, to find another piece of music, to go down sort of this reminiscence experience. Um, and I take it I use that concept in tandem with ISO principle to create mood and memory maps as well, to create playlists that facilitate all of those feel good memory emotions. So we can kind of use that to also trick our brain to come back to the here and now and experience those feelings right now if we're in a place of distress. Um, so something to be mindful if you're building a playlist and you're like, well, this is my favorite song and it was my first dance song with my ex-husband who I really hate now. Well, <laughs> that may not be the best one to put on your pump up playlist, even if you love it a lot. <laughs> just just an idea. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. And, you know, as an audience stand in, I suppose. But yeah. So what you're saying is that a playlist should be about transitioning you from one state to the other. It's not just about the end goal. So if I want a playlist that's going to get me pumped up, that theoretically a playlist that matches where I'm at initially, if I'm sad and then moves me to pumped up will be more effective. You know, if I target that specific, so I have my pump up playlist for if I'm sad to pump me up or if I'm tired to pump me up or if I'm bored to pump me up because the starting point matches where I'm at, even though I'm trying to get to the same end point. Exactly. And I, I want to say yes, in theory, 100%. Because the idea is if I'm truly experiencing an immense amount of depression, playing very joyous songs isn't going to tap in to get me out. It, yeah. it might even dissociate me more of like, well, I'll never feel that way. That is not true to my experience. That is not what I'm feeling right now. Whereas if you match where you are, even if that's with tempo and not with lyric or emotional connection, but generally when we're in a state of depression, we're feeling very slow and low regulation, even matching us there, getting in somewhere, in on that ground floor, then we can build up to get us to that really happy. And same with anger. If I'm feeling really angry and someone's like, oh, Brandon's feeling angry, <laughs> take a breath, Brandon. You'd be like, Alyssa, shut up, please. I'm not going to take a breath. I'm losing my mind right now. But what if I'm like, Brandon's really angry and he wants to hit the drum. Hit it, Brandon, hit it. You'd be like, yeah, I'm going to hit the drum. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hey, that's my best metal voice. I do my best when I can. <laughs> I know. The rest of this, we're just going to be duetting from now Yes, on. there you go. Exactly. Enjoy it. Um, no, in terms of attention, the way we talk about it, it's you pay most attention to the thing. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of things that guide your attention, but theoretically things that most match your current state is what's going to draw the attention. But then music, especially in, in the transition, and of course you could do this with other things, but yep. music is a little more controllable and predictable in certain ways that you start by matching where you're at so that your attention is more fully drawn to it. But then as it slowly kind of transitions, you follow along with it once you're attuned or connected or whatever word we want to use. Yeah. I mean, that engagement and wonder and excitement has to be there also for learning. And if we're trying to almost like retrain our brain and body to get to that state, we have to be fully engaged for it to be effective. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's an important piece that I'm sure you said, but let's just draw it out of. Yeah. Pick stuff you like, you know, like, yes. like even if classical music theoretically makes you more ready for academic work, if you don't enjoy classical music, that's not going to, your attention won't go to it in the first place to be modified by it. You know. Absolutely. And for learning, just so you know, 80 to 110 beats per minute is your optimal zone. Quick music is actually not as effective for learning. I was just reading an article on this. Um, Interesting. Can yeah. you give us some examples of 80 to 100? I mean, I can whip up my metronome and do 80 to 120. Let's see. So this is 90 beats per minute. It's not that slow. Yeah. Right. It could be any song that's at this like, here comes the sun. A do, 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 do. Right. And then 110 would feel a little faster. 
here comes the sun and i said it's all right right we're going with that tempo kind of feels like that so you can whoop, almost dropped it download a free metronome app and kind of figure out ooh, what tempo is this at most songs are going to be between 80 to 110 that's a really optimal zone for us and i'm sure there's a music therapist behind the scenes at music production companies but oh yeah yeah just like psychologists at game companies exactly. and social media companies yeah you're like I, you have to be there right yeah um cecil by the way who like is our you know tech you know producer support person put in the private chat lo-fi all the way which is a genre that i hear a lot of people a lot of young people especially talking about in terms of uh, what they like to listen to when they're studying or focusing on something else mm. um so maybe we can talk about some of those things. You know, we've we've shared kind of the concept of build a playlist that starts where you're at. You know, predictably, I might in the future be sad. So it starts where you're sad and then leads you to where you want to go. Maybe we can talk about some specific. And again, all of this is correlations. It's like, try this, explore this. It might not work. But what are some common things of if you're trying to, if you're in this emotional state, what's the kind of music that may most match it or lead you into a different kind of thing? Sure. I think if you're feeling like anxious or really angry, quick tempo, lots of percussion, because we're tapping into that rapid like heart rate kind of response. Um, metal music is interesting because people who enjoy metal music actually have some different wiring in their brains that that's relaxing and regulating for them. I really want to have time to talk about vocal stimming and auditory stimming and stuff. Yeah. Before I finish too, but I'm sure, finish sure. First. We'll try and fit it all in. <laughs> Um, so metal music, I feel like it's kind of unique, but that like pop punk rock, anything that's got really heavy drums, low tonality, a quick speed. If you can think of songs again, that you enjoy to listen to that are in that, those are really good. If you're feeling anxious, anger, um, I tend to gravitate towards very belty musical theater music because yeah, it's very uh, expressive and volumetic. Yeah, volumatic and dynamic vocals, screamy, yes. shouty vocals. Yes. Um, because I, you know, I'm a child of the 90s, I suppose, born in 85. But one of my favorite, like, angry songs is Graduate by Third Eye Blind, where, and of course, I'm very focused. I'm a words guy. I'm focused yeah. on the lyrics. But, you know, can I graduate, you know, total yeah. bastards talking down to me kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, what, so that's an angry thing. What's What about uh, something that, might help if we're trying to shift from anger into like contentment what kind of music might help yeah contentment? so then songs that kind of have i would slow down the tempo so if we're feeling anger we do want to be maybe above that optimal tempo zone of 120 to 140 beats per minute which is a lot quicker um down regulating the tempo till about to that 80 to 110 which is our optimal kind of regulation zone it's the tempo we breathe in it's the tempo our hearts beat in it's a good mind body connection regulation tempo and things with maybe less instrumentation, a softer tonality, steady tempos, steady rhythmic stimulation that we're getting, very repetitive and expected melodies too, because that can bring us to just a state of stabilization as well and contentment. Um, so I'm trying to think of like, what would be my go-to just chill song? There's a song that was really popular on Facebook and Instagram by Ty Verdes called A-OK. -Okay. Um, so it's just like living in this big blue world, da, 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 up in outer space. Can't remember the words. I'll be a -O -A -O -K. Real easy, light, just him and like a I'm small band. Like a girl in a ukulele kind of genre. Yeah, and Kobe Kelly. Um, what's that Jason Mraz. You know, that uh, the show, right? I'm just a little girl stuck so in the middle. Uh, yeah. That one. Um, okay, what about. I'm just gonna, we're just testing you now. Like, yeah, I, think, I don't about, always have the answer, y'all. <laughs> well, we're making your code, because that's the whole point, right? Is you have the underlying, okay, this is how tempo, this is how this, but then I can use that stuff to then arrive at a conclusion that is likely to work. Yes. Sad stuff, I feel like that's pretty easy. Everybody has their sad songs and their yeah. breakup songs. Yeah. Uh, what about anxious? What's, what's music that matches anxiety and might help to start an anxiety playlist and shift you out of it? Sure. And that's the one I feel like we have to be sometimes the most cautious of, because if we're activating anxiety, we can trigger a panic response. We want to be mindful of not upregulating there, but trying to match where we are there. Uh, so I think tempo can really help. 
for some of my, and this is where it's so individual. So I would pick one of the elements to match. So either you're matching the tempo or you're matching the volume or you're the matching the timbre um, or two of three, but not all because that can really just pull us deeper into that anxiety. It, that's a risky one. Um, so I would say figure out what feels good for you. For one of my clients, Bang Bang by Jesse J is like the ultimate anxiety song of you got a booty like a Cadillac. <laughs> right when they're screaming, that is one song I don't sing. Sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> I love it, but it's so high up there. So just it's really energetic and it's got that quick tempo and that volume, but it's not too overwhelming with levels of auditory sound. I'm sure someone put in the chat, like, please stop. <laughs> Um, um, somebody in the chat just says, I have a Don't Kill People playlist of slow paced, good heel songs that actually managed to soothe despite my mood. I love I like it. That. Yes. Don't Kill People playlist. That's a great one. So good. one of yes. the things I love about doing this and like being exposed to new things and learning is that then I reflect, and this is a very common neurodivergent thing as well, right? Is I learn by kind of relating it to my own personal experiences. Yeah. And you're giving me language to observe things, even that happened in the past, my own memories in new ways. And I'm realizing that, um, that one of my songs for anxiety for sure is i don't even know what the title is from hamilton george washington's like intro song because yes. he's so anxious he's like you know can i be real a second for just a melissa but by the end of it he comes to a conclusion of i need a right hand man and then it immediately stops and goes into i'm now solving the problem yes that's yeah interesting. it's right hand man is the name is that of that like song right -hand man? Yeah. there you go and of course that's one of the ones that i could do if I ever am in Hamilton, which somebody cast me in Hamilton, I got like it in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, Hamilton makes its way onto a lot of people's playlists. Yeah, well, show tunes on. you mentioned, and for me too, that's a very, you know, show tunes, especially older ones, really are just about taking a moment and emotion and expanding it into a whole song. Of course, the whole like, now I'm getting into my nerd theater -y stuff, but the whole like, evolution of the American musical started with we take we make a big spectacle then no we're going to take an emotional moment Oklahoma famously opens with oh what a beautiful morning yeah and expanding it the story pauses to expand the moment and then with Sondheim and others it started to transition into the story the music moves the story forward so in terms of transition stuff I would think that a lot of the more modern musical things are ones that are going to start in a certain place and take you to another place because I am now thinking I'll say this too, for those of us who are singers, which Alyssa obviously is, and I am, and Mike, you know, throw down some beats or something. Because <laughs> um, I'm realizing I do this, but through through song, rather than I don't like carry a playlist around with me, but I have my go-to songs. And I do even have like, when I'm showering, I sing this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, to like warm up my voice or get myself energized for the day. You know, I, I start with, um, if ever I would leave you from Camelot, but oh, by the yeah. end, uh, it's, um, moving too fast from the last five years. Oh, you know? great, great list. Some Jesus I mean, Christ superstar in there, you know. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be just listening. If you're a, someone who enjoys singing, sing it. Make make a list that you want to sing, absolutely. Like when I'm in a really emotive place, I'm making music doing that. That's my means of expression. That's yeah. not comfortable for everyone. They don't always use that. Sure. So that's why playlists are like, Beat well, everyone listens to it. Yeah. Snapping it out, snapping it out, yep. tapping it out. Yeah, moving we all do it. These things. So I did want to mention, because people know about stimming and fidgeting, yeah. which have a lot more overlap, I think, generally than people understand, and we don't have time to get into like my personal theories about why. But I want to make it clear for people that that vocal stimming or musically, you know, stimming, so echolalia, for example, just repeating the same sound over and over. Um, and yeah, I, I have, uh, this is a very common thing in people who are diagnosed ADHD, although again, I think it's broader than that. Uh, of like, you'll find yourself humming something on loop three hours later that you heard in the grocery store in the background and barely paid attention to. Yeah. Or that you'll have, for me, um, Rivers and Roads by the Head and the Heart. I don't ever choose to start humming it, but every day I hum it at least 20 times for the last like, five years. Hey. It seems to be just a regulatory thing my body does. Yeah. Um, so be aware of that we talk about fidgeting and stimming mostly in terms of like physical repetitive motions. But musicality and and voice and whatever is part of that as well. Absolutely, and it can be a self soothe. The thing in the grocery store too, I feel like that happens to everyone. They just don't always sing it out loud if that's not a comfort thing, but they're hearing it on loop because it's getting in subcortically. 
Right. It's it got in your ear. You have it there. Um, Sensation versus perception. You know, like your body is aware of the data, even if it doesn't admit into consciousness. Yeah. So, and I'll also say because this is one of my favorite things to tell people when they're trying to focus and they're getting distracted by a song in their head. First of all, don't try and fight any distraction. There's a. It's not really a distraction. It's an attraction. It's pulling your focus for some reason. You got to explore and engage with it. In this particular case, you don't need to know why. You just have a song pop into your head. And if you're going to get it out to whatever extent you are, you got to resolve it. Like take a break, step away and finish out the song. And then maybe it'll be less urgent. And you can get back to the other thing instead of trying to be like, no, no, I can't think of this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's and you're not alone <laughs> at all. I know. I, I mentioned before, I'm deeply weird. At one point, I was getting my blood drawn by a nurse and I was humming or she was humming and she was like, yeah, I hum all the time. You know, I just don't even realize that. I was like, well, you know, that's a sign of ADHD. I was like, Brandon, not everybody wants to be told they might have ADHD. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I got to get running. You can probably see my tempo speak, picking up, you know, as we're getting to the end of this. Yeah. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for being here today. And Brandon, thanks for hosting once again. Um, thank you, everybody that joined us today. If you want to learn more, check out Dynamic Links. Uh, again, it's L-Y-N-K-S. Um, check it out. Just Google, Google her and just check out Music Theory. Try it out. Or just, sorry, Music Therapy. <laughs> yeah. Music Theory, too. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yes, we're, we aren't going to end the show with a Rickroll. I that was my <laughs> said, yeah. But uh, thank you all for joining us, and we'll be back here next week, next time, with another episode of Effective Artistry, the Neurodivergent Mind, and Executive Functioning. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody. Good talking. I'm sure we'll talk again soon, I hope.